Hey folks, welcome back to Mainville ATV and Outdoors, where we do all things all-terrain. It's a new slogan I'm trying out. I like it. It's pretty good. Yeah. And today we're going to be talking about Project Mischief, our 2018 Outlander XMR 1000R. And we're going to be talking about five things that we like and dislike. So stay tuned for that. Before we get into this video, I'm going to be giving away some stickers. How it's going to work is just discuss down below anything that you like or dislike in this video, start a conversation, and I will be picking three random winners to get one of each of our stickers. One outdoor UV sticker, one indoor beer fridge sticker, whatever you want. Um, so we just wanted to give something to you guys, and uh, yeah, so make sure you like, comment, and subscribe in the video. We'll pick a random winner, and uh, a couple days after this releases, we'll make sure you guys know who the winner is and get these out to you. So welcome back. In case you're new here, I'm Kyle. This is my wife Cass. And of course, we're the Mainvilles. And like we said before, this is five things we like and dislike about our Project Mischief Outlander. Um, it's been a great machine. Uh, it has problems just like any other, but we're going to start with our dislikes. Number five and that's ride comfort. When we got the machine, uh, it came with Fox podium shocks. Uh, they were a little rough, and, and by a little rough, I mean when you're doing a long-term trip, I know this is a mudding machine specifically, but obviously you want to get as much bang for your buck as possible. So I also do trail riding. And with that, uh, when I did go on trips that were 200 kilometers plus, um, I would come home and just be absolutely beat. Um, so we have made changes since then and a lot of adjustments. It's not perfect. It's more of the design of the machine than just the suspension. Uh, the suspension can really fix it. Uh, the vast majority of the issues were fixed by going with Elka suspension. Uh, we also have a video for that if you're interested in it. Um, that being said, the 19s and 20s started making changes with the suspension and so I think even Can-Am knew that some changes were required. So. Definitely a dislike for me was the ride comfort, uh, and still kind of is. So, Dislike number four. Uh, so this isn't a problem that affects everyone or every rider out there that'll be on this machine, but myself being a smaller statured person, uh, self-proclaimed or not, I struggle with the, the stature of the bike. Not necessarily the wheelbase, but things like the handlebars, uh, the footwells, and the seat. So the handlebars and footwells just generally being just a little bit out of reach, just a little bit wider. So I struggle with that. And the seating as well, just being a little bit thicker, wider in certain areas, it really prevents you from getting a comfortable fit on the bike and or ATV. And um, I struggle with maintaining that control, which I'll talk about a little bit later. It's a big machine. I can see why it's daunting. Like. You also get used to whatever machine you're riding to a lot. So when you have that sudden change of like Cass, for example, going from her Kodiak to my Outlander, there's there's big differences in there. So to, to be used to something and hopping on another can be a big factor in, in that dislike. So for a lot of people like myself, that's a huge like on, in my opinion. Um, so we'll touch on her bike a little more in another video, but uh, there's definitely a comparison in that way. Mm -hmm. So, dislike number three. Um, this is kind of something that has blown up on the internet in the past. Um, some people have brought to my attention uh, something that kind of I assumed but didn't happen, and that's the snorkel design. So, they are snorkeled, the XMR models are snorkeled, and it's all proper. The one thing that's kind of misleading is only your intake is actually as high as it looks and other things like your CVT intake will be much lower. So you can assume when you buy this machine, if you don't look into all these little details, it's kind of hard without videos like the one we're making right now, that you can go into deep water as high as that. 
it's just not the case. There's actually other intakes and breathers that are, are lower. So without making an adjustment to that or buying an aftermarket kit and so on, um, you'll actually have issues. So that's something to be aware of is the, the snorkel extension kit sold by Can-Am is actually a little misleading. So dislike number two, control. I'm a person who likes being in control. If you talk to my husband, if you talk to my boss, if you talk to my mom. You're going to be wondering so many things right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, dislike number two, control. Insert nothing else. Moving on. <laughs> to reach back on the stature of the machine, being just a little bit out of my comfort zone in terms of the handlebars, the footwells, and the seat. Uh, a kind of side effect to that is the control aspect of when you're riding. The experience overall of having an added anxiety of not being able to have the bike be as responsive as you would like it to be. So turning or when you go over a rock or a bump, I'm kind of finding that my experience riding this machine is that if I hit a rock, like I'm not going to be able to stop or counteract that movement as well as if I had a smaller statured bike, if that makes sense. Yeah, a lot of the control aspects on these machines is also, it is a big machine. It is a, I like to call it a lumbering idiot because that's what it feels like to ride. Um, a lot of it's based on some of your experience. Is your experience on bigger machines? It does have a lot of power. Um, so those things kind of uh, make the control aspect seem hard. Mm -hmm. So. Um, a lot of that can be changed and over time you get much better at it. Uh, a lot of my riding experience is on this machine, so it's not one of my dislikes, but I can see why it certainly can be a dislike. Yeah. So my last dislike, number one, is the stock clutching. Now it's not to say that it's uh, you know, a bad adjustment or completely a design fail or flop, however you want to look at it. It, and it also kind of is, I saw a massive improvement by changing my stock primary clutch. The primary is one of the biggest things that you can change and we'll touch more on that at the end of this video in some of the frequently asked questions. But the stock primary, when you're playing with performance machines and you start modifying it, it starts to give way. It has a little bit of slip. It's a two-piece design. So when you would punch it in some scenarios, the two the two sides of the primary clutch would actually be would give a little bit of slip and it was very hard on belts and, and a few other things there's lots of ways around that you can certainly work with the primary clutch and it's definitely not going to screw you in the long run you just need to understand that the two-piece design is not adequate in my opinion when you start getting into the, the big power ranges of like the 650 850 and 1000 especially when it comes to side by sides and when they're adding turbos and all this stuff so Can-Am using this clutch basically on their whole line um, is a great idea on their part, business-wise, obviously, but when it comes to some of these performance machines, it just doesn't quite work as well as it should. So I changed to a QSC, uh, a clutch that was uh, brought to our attention by DirtyLight.ca, one of our sponsors. Um, and there's a lot of different one-piece uh, aftermarket clutches. There's uh, CV Tech. QSC. QSC and STM. As far as I know, there could be many more, uh, but just by switching to a one-piece clutch, you'll see drastic improvements in your machines. Uh, if you're not a clutching expert, and that includes me, uh, I always suggest getting help by someone who's definitely more knowledgeable. Uh, Adam Schumacher, Schumacher, not sure how to say his name exactly. He's the one who set up my clutch, and it was fantastic out of the gate. So now we're getting into likes. Uh, obviously we want to end this on a positive note. Uh, overall, my experience with this, this machine is very, very positive. Um, it's one of the best things I've ever purchased as far as a machine. And uh, that's what I really want you guys to walk away with. Um, we struggled actually to come up with five dislikes just to make it even. Yeah, yeah. Uh, luckily there's two of us. So finding these things uh, has been a little easier because uh, we, our ride styles are different, our experience is very different, so the dislikes we were able to cobble up together between the two of us. But, Especially uh, when it comes to likes and dislikes, it's all about perspective, it's all about the rider, it's all about your personal opinions, so I mean, those are going to differ even amongst us. So. The reason we're doing this video is because people ask all the time, you know, what do you like, what do you not like, what's the history of your machine look like, what do you suggest, so that's why we're doing all this stuff. 
So we're going to start it off with uh, like number five, and that's power. Mm -hmm. So obviously, I like the power. Um, there's very few machines on the market that compare, and that's the honest truth. Um, I've tried very uh, many, many different machines from uh, like the high lifter, probably its most direct competitor, uh, down to a brute force, which starts to water down, but still twin. Um, and then obviously it just veers off completely. Um, like a 700 single in the power department that's in Cass's Kodiak is just not going to keep up. Um, I've had plenty of people that come from uh, like fully modified high lifters and they'll hop on this and they just love the response. They love uh, the power like we're talking about. Keeping in mind, of course, that I've done a lot of modification, testing and time into this specific machine. Um, so that might change as far as this two stock comparisons, right? So um, definitely the power is uh, one of the most sought after things and I'm glad I picked what I did. Very happy with this machine that way. This brings us right into like number four, uh, one that I'm a fan of actually, and it draws another comparison between the Outlander and the Yamaha, is the engine braking. For some reason that's something that stood out to me. Uh, I quite enjoy that as part of the riding experience in that that's one of the ways that this machine is very responsive in terms of the, the engine braking. So on my machine, that's not something that's very prevalent in, in the ride experience. And that's also something that kind of um, requires or that brings us into more of a maintenance requirement. So my machine needed brakes before Kyle's machine. Uh, very. Like I was metal on metal at one point, Much earlier. and that's because you're relying on the braking power of the machine, the brake pads, the oh. all those components. <laughs> I'm looking at you. Yeah. <laughs> Insert components oh, here. So the the clutch design. So basically, if you guys don't know, um, the way they do engine braking is very different. Like if you're a truck driver, you know what uh, engine braking is, or diesels in general. Um, so the idea of, of engine braking people are aware of, but the way it works on these machines is right off the shaft of the engine you have a primary and in that primary is a spray clutch. And by design it's basically a spray clutch. It's a one-way clutch. So when you're driving along and your primary is spinning that belt to your secondary and you have the whole translation of powertrain, the, when you let go of that throttle, the one-way bearing that's in there will actually slow everything down. Um, so <clears throat> on the Can-Ams, I find them very strong to the point where they'll actually, if you just fully drop the throttle after a full pin, you'll nosedive. Yeah. Um, and that changes a little bit with some of the aftermarket clutches that we've been talking about. Um, so a lot of ways these aftermarket clutches reduce uh, or increase low end torque is by uh, making the spray clutch a little smaller, allowing for more belt travel and so on. But uh, mm -hmm. So even with the aftermarket primary clutch that I have, it's very, very aggressive engine braking. And once you know how it all works, how it feels and how to use it, it's a super, super plus. Mm -hmm. And it's something that people kind of just, you know, don't think about, but it, uh, definitely one of our biggest likes on the machine. Yeah, and it just saves those components from wear and tear in general. Like it's less expensive and it's not something that you're gonna regret using that over the braking power over time. Like? Number three, and this one's going to be a bit of a hot topic. I can't wait to see the, the comment section, but here's the truth. Um, <laughs> this is reliability and ease of maintenance. Why is that in the likes you said? Why not? For a can like? am. <gasps> the comment section right now. Oh, screw you. <laughs> can am sucks. No one likes you. Polaris for life. My Honda can do what your Can-Am does, no problem. <laughs> Can-Am, oh, you should never be able to say that. Here's the thing, I work on a lot of quads. My friends' quads are side-by-sides. Um, and I start to get a feel for what's going on around me. I see people's videos, what's coming up a lot. Uh, obviously, we're quite in-depth with this sport, and I see all the little things. And my experience has been very good when it comes to this machine. Um, I have basically had two seals go in the rear diff, uh, power steering, which is totally my fault, by the way, because assassinators are heavy. Um, we have a video on that. 71 pounds, by the way. Anyway, uh, you know, 
I had uh, some studs blow out, but that was actually because Can-Am put out a bad recommendation, and since then they corrected it. Um, rolled it a couple times. I rolled it. it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, you know, sure, we do trail riding and exploring and stuff like that too, but we've done lots of mudding and just thrashing on these machines, and it's really held up. And I broke down the numbers. She bought her machine after me, and it's just over in the amount of money we've spent on maintenance between the two machines. So there's a bit more to that story, of course. I'm obviously I'll... trying to put this bike through the same stuff of performance right. that I was trying to. Uh, and touching on that, when I did have to work on it, it was actually great to work on. Um, so <clears throat> the access to just something simple like doing an oil change, the access to where the oil filter is, mm -hmm how to drain it, everything like that. Everything was in a great location. Uh, everyone likes to complain like if they have to switch a, a rear phase shaft out of the back of a Can-Am, like, oh, it's such a big task. But if you look at some of the competitors and the way they design their machines, some of these simple tasks that are quite easy on the Outlander are just more parts in the way, and they never really thought about how to disassemble and make things a little easier on the user. So. It's been very user friendly that way when it comes to it. So uh, can't wait to see the comments on what you guys say. Uh, and I will say it again, this machine has been very reliable uh, and very great to work on. There's no segue here for this one, but this brings us to number two. So one of my likes and preferences of the Max Outlander XMR 1000 was the fact that we could put the two up seat on it. And that was one of our main reasons to for going with the max frame rather than the XTP model. Um, and that being said, I've, I've ridden on the back of a three-wheeler on a chunk of foam, and <laughs> I've been in a lot of different situations on the back of Hondas, on the back of other machines, on racks, on you name it. I'm not comparing to those riding experiences. However, the back of the two-up on this machine is quite comfortable with the link system, with the seats that are available from OEM, with the OEM foot pegs, the racer pegs back here. Um, just riding two-up on the back of this machine, comparing to other machines, not necessarily the three-wheeler and the chunk of foam, but it's a, it's a quite comfortable experience overall when you're comparing to the other models available out there. And of course, our last like, like number one, and uh, I feel like count, ah, 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 one, like, <laughs> like you guys can't count, um, is definitely um, the work plate aspect of this machine and another big deciding factor in why I chose it. It is an XMR. Um, it's fully designed for the mud race division and, and all that fun stuff. So I already know it can do that. And it does a great job. It's proven itself. On a side note, uh, we bought it with a plow. Um, we bought it with the hitch, of course, that comes with it. So I was moving trailers, plowing the yard. Um, I've winched trees down. It has a great rear rack for when we were trapping. Um, a lot of great aspects when it comes to that. And you're saying, or thinking, you know, why does all that matter? Well, if you take a look at the exact same frame and engine in a Renegade, well, those racks start getting smaller or don't exist at all. Um, hooking up a plow to it is a little more awkward. Um, it's, it's more of a utilitarian version of that same pure sport model. So that's one of the big things that I love about this machine is I feel a little more capable of doing it all instead of being limited to that pure sport style. So for this last part, I'm gonna do like my top three most frequently asked questions and we've sort of done them in the past but I wanted to just kind of grab them and say something real quick about them. Number one most asked question is tire fitment. Now a lot of the renegades and stuff I'm going to touch on first it's much easier because of their body design and the way they work to just throw any tire on. A lot of people like to make assumptions that you can sort of do that too with the Outlander and it's not the case. The square design in plastics on the machine and the footwells and all that make it much more difficult. So I'm going to tell you my experience. This isn't just like, you know, a follow rule. So it's quite vast. There's a lot of intricate things that are involved with tire fitment. So my experience is as long as you have a nine wide tire on a completely bone stock 1000, you can fit roughly a 30 as long as it's nine wide and below. 
And the big reason for that is the way the plastics works is you're just going to start scraping on all sorts of things. And in the rear, you'll, on the stock plastics, you're going to start getting into stuff. So I, it's width that's the biggest issue. Um, and height can change. And I have 32s. And the only way 32s are possible is, again, keeping it small. So these Moto Havocs are 8.5 wide. So I follow that width rule that I kind of came up with. And then the only way 32 is possible is I have high lifter stretched arms in the back, making it longer, and I have the Super ATV front um, extended arms on it also. So all of that's from Dirty Life. I had to stretch the machine out and I did foot wells. So at this point, it's fully comfortable at 32. There's a lot of other ways you can kind of get away with things, but you're going to have scraping, you know, self-clearancing as people like to call it. You can get to 32 true size with all of this done. Try to stay around 30, eight and a half, nine wide, and you should be good. Another thing to consider, of course, is wheel offset. Um, being Canadian, we're going to use the science system called metric. Uh, I have zero problems with a zero mil offset. So that's every rim that I've got here now is on a zero mil offset. When I had the assassinators and I had to run spacers and stuff, it's because I didn't know that yet. So those assassinators told me a lot about what you have to do. So zero mil offset, keep it under nine inches wide, and you can do a 30-ish on stock, true size, not like that weird 27 and three quarter cryptid thing they're doing. And you can get to 32s by blowing a bunch of money with dirty life. My second most frequently asked question is, how do I make more power? Power, power. Here's what I'm gonna tell you. If you're asking that question, you better have somebody who's great at tuning nearby, somebody who's great at clutching nearby, uh, somebody who can get into actual motor modifications. Uh, otherwise, my rule of thumb, and this applies to myself too, is try not to make more power to make more power. It's to use the power you already have better. And that always comes down to getting grip, uh, clutches. So again, we're talking about the primary one piece, grip design, all that stuff. And then it really comes down to driver ability. You really just want to make use of the power you already have. A lot of people just aren't doing that. And that's what I think it really comes down to. I know that's kind of a broad thing to say, but at the end of the day, Try not to make more power. Start by using the power you already have. Just better. Number three most common question I get is what is the best mod for these machines? And I'm talking about the Outlander specifically, but you're going to start to see a bit of a pattern in this whole video. My favorite mod, what I think is the best mod, the first thing I would do, clutching before anything else, um, before tuner, before pipe, before whatever. If you only have so much money, the first thing I would do is a clutch. CV Tech, STM, QSC, I don't care what you go with. Um, just make sure it's done properly and done right by a professional, um, unless you know what you're doing. And uh, like I said, you're gonna see that pattern. The clutching was such a drastic, massive difference. Um, that's what I would go with first. It just woke up the machine to the point where I almost had to relearn how to drive it. It was so violent. In one of our rides, I almost hit a person. I was just, <laughs> I was just like, I didn't know that was coming. She was a nice lady. <laughs> um, and after that, I would really start looking at uh, tires. Uh, I would do that even before an exhaust. Um, tires can really change the game. Uh, if you're fortunate enough to have multiple sets of tires, I would definitely do a trail tire or a rock tire or a mud tire and just have options. Um, Based on your, what you're riding. Yeah, like, that's We really don't have best. a purpose for rock tires, rock crawling or anything like that. Based on we are, we're, we're living right now in the trail access that we have. But if we move somewhere else, that's what we're gonna be doing. We might be able to get rid of a set of tire or just add it to the collection, why not? But. Yeah. <laughs> so having the proper tire can really change the game. Um, and then after that, it kind of falls off a little bit. So what I would say is go for anything function-wise first, uh, and then grab all your fun stuff. I know it's hard. Um, I have a big, loud RJWC pipe. I understand that you might want to do that. Try to use your money the right way first. Um, but if you're just like, oh, well, Kyle, I'm going to put a loud pipe and send it. I get that. <laughs> I understand. Just I... don't forget to tune it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
Performance pipes, free flow, tuning, do it, just do it. These machines, honestly, tune them. ECU flash or a proper tuner or any way, you know, some people call them blinky boxes, whatever you want to do, mm -hmm. make sure you tune it. We and, see, uh, uh, even people like, oh, I have a Yoshi, I don't have to. If you ever put these machines on a dyno and see the AFRs, you're gonna want to tune it, piper, no piper, whatever pipe you've got. Mm -hmm. It's just a good way to go. In the long run, those little differences make a massive change. Can am sucks. No one likes you. Polaris for life. My Honda can do what your Can am does, no problem.